Sania Barcher governed Nigeria from 1993 to 1998 after he overthrew the interim president, Ernest Schoenecken, in a military coup. Although initially he made a positive impact on Nigeria's economy and development, Abacha's unchecked kleptocracy led to Nigeria's downfall during this time. Keep watching to learn more about this man and his eventful five-year tenure. Please also don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button. It helps our channel grow and allows us to make more videos like this one. Sani Abacha was born in Kano, Nigeria in 1943. His entire career was spent in the military in which he started his training at the Nigerian Military Training College and was commissioned in 1963 after he had attended the Mons Officer Cadet School in Aldershot, England. Abacha was the first and only military head of state who never skipped a rank to become a full-star general. Abacha was a key player in the numerous military coups that took place during his career. He was merely a second lieutenant with the 3rd Battalion stationed in Kaduna when he became involved in the planning of the July 1966 Nigerian counter-coup. By 1975, he was promoted to become commander of the 2nd Infantry Division. In 1983, Abacha was promoted to General Officer commanding of the 2nd Mechanized Division and given a seat on the Supreme Military Council. In 1983, Abacha played a vital role in two Nigerian coup d'etat one which brought General Muhammadu Buhari to power, and the other which removed Buhari and replaced him with General Ibrahim Babangida. General Ibrahim Babangida appointed Abacha as Chief of Army Staff in 1985 when he was named President and Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Later, in 1990, Abacha became Minister of Defence. Then in 1993, as Minister of Defence, he struck and removed interim president, Ernest Schoenecken, in a coup d'etat. In his televised broadcast to the nation, Abacha described the overthrow as a way to bring stability through the socio-political uncertainties caused by the 1993 presidential election. Operating from the presidential complex at Asso Rock in Abuja, he enjoyed using raw power to crush all opponents and amass a personal fortune. His actions were unequivocally more ruthless than that of his predecessors. He was a very reclusive figure and seldom made public appearances or travelled outside the country. In fact, during his presidency in the 1990s, he never once visited Lagos, the commercial capital of Nigeria. He had excellent security personnel and always remained well protected, so most ministers and members of the ruling military council never got to meet him. The few people he did communicate with were close civilian advisers and business cronies. From Asso Rock, Abacha generated an atmosphere of terror that Nigerians had not encountered previously. The general population, vexed and indignant that the military had thwarted endeavours to set up democratic government once again, realised that expressing discontent around Abacha's dictatorship entailed a steep price. Abacha is prepared to reduce Nigeria to rubble as long as he survives to preside over a name, Wale Soyinka, the Nobel Prize laureate, wrote in 1995 after leaving for exile. Within months of his coup in November 1994, Abacha faced rising public clamour for him to step down. Much of the derision came from southern political groups who felt the presidential election won by the Yoruba tycoon Chief Abiola had been stolen from them by northern generals. The opposition press ran vigorous campaigns against military rule. In May 1995, the National Democratic Coalition, NADECO, issued an ultimatum to Abacha, demanding he turn over power to Abiola on May 31st. On the 11th of June, Abiola declared himself president and stated he would be sworn in during a short ceremony in Lagos, but Abacha refused to capitulate and ordered Abiola's arrest on the grounds of treason. Chaos ensued. An oil worker's indefinite strike was joined by bank employees, teachers and nurses, paralyzing refineries, terminals and other installations throughout the country. This led to acute shortages of petroleum products, reducing exports by a third. To end the strikes, Abacha employed bribes, threats, arrests, thuggery and eventually unmitigated repression. The oil workers' unions were shuttered. Pro-democracy activists were jailed. Nadeco was outlawed. And independent newspapers such as The Concord, The Guardian and Punch were censored. Critics spoke of a new, dark age. In March 1995, Abacha officials claimed they found evidence of a coup plot and began a new purge. This included the arrest of two former generals who spoke out against military rule, Alusigun Obasanjo and Shehu Ya Adua. His greatest challenge while in power was yet to come. 
dissent was beginning to bubble beneath the surface in the Niger Delta. In dealing with dissident minority groups of the Niger Delta region, the location of Nigeria's oil wealth, Abacha acted with his usual ferocity. The primary complaint of Delta activists was that the oil revenues produced by their region were used largely to benefit other parts of the country while they themselves suffered from neglect. The Delta region in Nigeria was among the poorest and most underdeveloped, without access to common amenities such as electricity or piped water. Additionally, schools and hospitals were not well funded. Moreover, the Delta had to contend with the burden of environmental degradation. Oil spills from pipelines polluted the land and waterways. Gas flaring polluted the air. Fish were contaminated, destroying the livelihood of farmers and fishermen. During the 1970s and 1980s, various Delta communities launched sporadic protests at multinational oil companies. In the early 1990s, however, more organized resistance emerged, directed not just at the companies but at the government. Foremost among them was the movement for the survival of Agoni people, Mossop, founded in 1990. The principal founder of Mossop, Ken Saro Wiwa was a writer, television producer and business entrepreneur, born in Agoniland. A diminutive figure, with a vituperative turn of phrase, he was best known in Nigeria as the creator of Bassi and Company, a television soap opera watched by 30 million Nigerians each week that lampooned the country's get-rich-quick mentality. Saro Wiwa's main bugbear was the plight of Agoniland, an area of no more than 400 square miles in the river state. Since 1958, its wells had produced about $30 billion worth of oil, yet nominal amounts had trickled down to the people living there. He cast the blame on both Anglo-Dutch Shell and the Nigerian government. Egoni protests and rallies began to proliferate in the region. Abacha responded by sending in troops to protect oil installations and announced a ban on all public gatherings and demonstrations. He also issued a decree declaring that demands for self-determination and disruptive activities affecting oil production would be considered acts of treason punishable by death. After a series of clashes between the Agoni and the government, culminating in the death of four conservative leaders by a local mob, Saro Wiwa and eight other activists were arrested. They were tried and found guilty of murder and sentenced to death. Despite worldwide calls for clemency, the Agoni Nine were executed two days later on 10 November 1994. As a result, Nigeria was subsequently suspended from the Commonwealth. Abacha remained indifferent to the barrage of condemnation that came from abroad. The execution of the Agoni Nine had served its purpose of warning critics what the cost of opposing him was. Other notable victims included Kadirat Abiola, the wife of Chief Abiola. She was gunned down in her car in Lagos by security agents. General Yar Adua was another victim, being murdered whilst in prison. The army too was purged of dissidents. Abacha's deputy, General Oladipo Dr, and other Yoruba officers were charged with plotting a coup and executed. To perpetuate his grip on power, Abacha next turned his attention to obtaining a popular mandate for his rule. He allowed the registration of five political parties, all of which were closely identified with members of his regime and its supporters. All five political parties duly assembled conventions, each selecting Sani Abacha as their presidential candidate. His tyrannical plans were however cut short. On the 8th of June 1998, Abacha died in the arms of a pair of Indian prostitutes. His cause of death is still debated to this day. Official reports say he died of a heart attack. Others suggest he may have been poisoned. The extent to which Abacha enriched himself during his five-year tenure began to unfold in the months following his death. One of the ways Abacha gathered such a vast fortune was by asking an advisor to request money from him for a security matter with no specific details. He would then sign off on the request, and the advisor would take it to the central bank. The central bank would give out the money, which was often in cash form. Most of the money was then taken to Abacha's house, with some even being transported, by the truckload, in dollar notes. Abacha didn't stop at just one method to rob the country blind. He had many, for example, he would inflate state contracts and keep the difference for himself, or extort foreign companies interested in doing business in Nigeria. Transparency International estimate that he stole between two and five billion dollars during his tenure. Most of the money ended up being kept in bank accounts in Switzerland, Liechtenstein, France and the United Kingdom. In 1999, Alusagun Obasanjo, 
the president of Nigeria at the time, recruited the services of Swiss lawyer, Enrico Monfrini, to help to locate the illicit funds and return them to Nigeria. In a BBC article published on the 28th of January 2021, Mr. Monfrini confirmed that his work secured the restitution of just more than $2.4 billion which Abacha had stolen from Nigeria.